So James, the brother of Jesus, writes this epistle to, to um, Jewish, primarily Jewish believers in, um, in, in the first century. And in there, he tells us, if you're going through a tough time, if you're in an in the meantime set of circumstances, there's something you must believe. So that's what we're gonna look at today. So I'll start it off and then we'll, I'm just gonna walk you through these verses together. It's in James chapter one, verse one, and here's what he says. It says, this is amazing, the, the, the front end of this is amazing to me. James, a servant of God, okay, but now we can do that, servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He refers to his brother as his Lord. That's amazing. That should just make you at least consider Christianity if you've kind of written this off. I get that. Then he goes on and he gives us the hard part. He says this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever, doesn't qualify it, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's when you want to go, okay, I'm not doing that. That's silly. And I'm telling you, I would never ask you to do this. This is James talking, okay? James says, consider, this little Greek word right here is so interesting, basically saying, no, wait, 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 wait. When bad things happen, you kind of go into a funk. When bad things happen, you want to hit the ejection button. When bad things happen, you fight it, you resist it, you, write it, you try to change it. James says, I want you instead, I want you to, em to embrace or adopt a different mindset toward adversity. Now, you don't have to do it yet, but I, just, but I want to tell you what it is. He says, I want you to, instead of considering it terrible, the end of the world, my life will never be the same, I'll never be happy again. I want you con to consider, or I want you to think about it as a source of something good. To which, again, we could all raise our hand and say, okay, wait till I tell you my story. There is no way this applies to me. James says, just hold on. I'm just, I'm just getting started. I want you to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face. And this little Greek word here, it's so interesting. It's used of a robbery. It's used of being shipwrecked. It's, it's, it's something that surprises you, takes you by surprise. You're not expecting it. You're just kind of going along, doing your thing, minding your own business, and boom, there's some big, bad set of circumstances that takes you by surprise. So James says, my brothers and sisters, believers, people who love God, when you face adversity, when something takes you by surprise, the doctor calls, your sister calls, you show up at work and it's not good news, instead of assuming the worst, I want you to think about adversity differently and I want you to consider it as possibly the source of something good. Again, I would never tell you this. This is James and then he continues because because you know, or actually it's a participle, knowing that, knowing that the testing of your faith, and we have to hit the pause button here because this is an enormously important sentence. James affirms what we suspect. James underscores what we know, that whenever you hit a bump in life, it tests your faith. It tests the integrity of your faith, that trials put your faith on trial, don't they? Trials put your faith on trials. Trials put God on trial. Trials cause us all to look up and go, really? Or I thought I believed, or I've always believed, or I'm minding my own business, I've been a good person, I've been a good husband, I've been a good wife. Are you kidding me? You would allow this to happen to me? And James acknowledges this when he says, because the testing of your faith, that every set of circumstances that are negative, every adversity is a test of, of your faith. Do you really believe? Will you continue to believe? Can you continue? to believe, essentially to sort of sum it up, it's, it's this, it's, it's trials test our confidence in God, don't they? Trials test our confidence in God. I'm so glad he added this because it lets us know that he knows what we're thinking. He continues, he says, you know or knowing that the testing of your faith and then he points us in a direction that's uncomfortable but somehow we know is true that the testing of your faith produces something and it produces perseverance. Trials produce persevering faith. That's his point. The trials produce persevering faith. And when you read the New Testament, especially the teaching of Jesus, here's what you discover. If Jesus spoke on behalf of God, if the apostle Paul spoke on behalf of God, if the Old Testament speaks on behalf of God, God seems to honor and God is most glorified by persevering faith. And here's the deal. Faith that always gets a yes from God, no one is impressed by that. 
That's hocus pocus, that's magic, that's prosperity preaching. The faith that impresses you the most, and I don't even know you, but I know this about you because we're all the same in this way, in this regard. The faith that impresses us the most is the faith that gets a no from God or gets no answer from God and continues to endure anyway. It's not the faith that always gets a yes, I prayed on Thursday and by Friday, woohoo, you know, I lost my job on Monday, got a better one on Wednesday because I prayed and I fasted. I mean, that's impressive, but when we hear those stories, we, you know what we think? We think, I wanna know the formula, I wanna know the math. We don't fall in love with God, we fall in love with, okay, tell me how you did that, tell me how you did that, tell me how you did that because I'm going to do what you did so I can get what you got. God's going, are you kidding? That doesn't honor me. Let me tell you what honors me. It's the person that believes anyway. It's the person that trusts me anyway. It's the person that perseveres anyway. And throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament, God is honored by, God is glorified by persevering faith. That's why James says, okay, now look, when the bottom falls out, when things are tough, before you go into your, a nosedive, before you hit the eject button, before you quit praying, before you tear up your Bible, before you, you know, say, I'm never going back to church, just wait, 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 wait. It's possible that God is up to something good. And then he answers the question, what is God up to? God is up to developing persevering faith and you don't want persevering faith and I don't want persevering faith, but persevering faith is most honoring to God. Trials produce persevering faith. And then James gets to the first imperative. In the Greek text, everything else has been sort of participles and nouns and verbs. And he gets to the first imperative. In other words, this is his main point. This is the thing he wants us to take away as it relates to somehow seeing good, bad things as good things. He says this, let, this is the imperative, let perseverance, I love this phrase. I don't like to do this, but I love the way he says this. Let perseverance finish its work. Let perseverance finish its work. In other words, God is at work in you and you can hit the eject button, you can hit the divorce button, you can hit the bankruptcy button, you can hit the cheat button, you can hit the alcohol button, you can hit the weed button, you can hit the run button, you can hit the lie button, you can hit all kinds of buttons to relieve your pain and relieve your circumstances. And James says, no, wait, 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 come on, wait, wait, wait. God is up to something. God is in the process of building in you the kind of faith that honors him the most and as we're gonna see, the kind of faith that awes people the most. So let faith, or let endurance finish its work. Let endurance finish its work. There's a sense in which, and then we'll move on. There's a sense in which, as you think about the greatest tension in your life right now, it could be with one of your sons or your daughter, it could be in your marriage, it could be financially, professionally, with your boss, with a grandchild, it could be with your health. As you, as you think about your greatest tension, the thing that just absorbs your thought when you pray is what you pray about. In fact, for some of you, you haven't prayed in years and you find yourself kind of to whom it may concern. You know, if there's anybody up there, you know, I got a rabbit's foot, a star of David and a cross, I'll, you know, what, what do I need? You know, you're, you're, suddenly you're becoming weird religious because you're, you're at your wit's end, you don't know what to do. Here's, here's my point, listen. The tension, the tension, your greatest tension right now in your life can be, can be the focal point of God's activity in your life if you choose to trust. This is what he's saying. That that thing in your life that you wouldn't wish on anybody and you would, would love to wish away and you wish you could go back and you know, somehow undo it, that very thing is the epicenter. It can be the focal point of God's activity in your life if you will allow it to be by allowing perseverance to finish its work. Now, one more thing about this. This is so, this is so huge. You see, for some of you, for some of you, your story, and I'm not making fun, we, I, you know, we, we build our churches for people who are coming back to faith or people who don't have faith. I mean, this, it's what we do, we love it. You know, we, we love baptism stories. But the story that we've heard so often, and maybe this is part of your story, is that at some point in your past, you hit a bump and you hit the ejection button. You abandon faith, you abandon God, you abandon the Bible, you abandon the Old Testament, you abandon the synagogue, you abandon the, abandon the temple, whatever your deal was, you just walked away from all of it because something bad happened. And instead of considering it pure joy, instead of enduring, instead of trusting God anyway, you hit the, you hit the eject button. And let's be honest, that did not make your life better. I, I, I you know, I don't, 
I mean, there may be exceptions. There's exceptions to every rule, but the stories we hear over and over and over are not, you know what, when I was younger or when I was in college, you know, this happened or that happened and I walked away from God and I'm glad I did good riddance, but I've made better decisions. I've been healthier. My relationships are better. I'm more generous. I'm more compassionate. I'm just a better person once I got God out of the picture. I mean, generally what we hear is something bad happened. And I said, well, God, if that's how it is, forget it. You know, I went to this church and they, my mom got divorced, parents got divorced and they threw my mom out so I left too or I got pregnant, they didn't know what to do with that or they found out my brother was gay, they didn't know what to do with that. So we just walked away from the whole thing, you know? Walked away from it and uh, I, I, I know why I walked away but I wish I hadn't walked away because my life didn't get better, my life got more complicated. And James would say, look, I'm not judging you and I'm not upset with you. I'm just saying, don't, do, don't make that mistake again. Let perseverance finish its work. Because at the end of the process, your persevering faith is gonna bring more honor to God and it's gonna bring you and leave you in a better place. Then he goes on. He says, let perseverance finish its work so that, this is a purpose statement or a result statement, so that you may be, and this is, this is a new idea for some of us, okay? So that you may be mature. How do I become a mature Christian? You allow perseverance to finish its work. What else you got? Is there some other ways? No. What if I memorize more scripture? That's good, but that won't make you mature. That'll make you smart. Well, what if, what if I obey every rule and every law and every commandment? That's good, that'll make you obedient. It will not make you mature. In fact, there's a cool thing going on. The Greek word finish is the same word, Greek word for mature. There's a little word play here that you don't catch, pick up in the English. Here's what he's saying, I'm gonna add it at the bottom. He's saying this. Let perseverance complete its work so you will be complete. Let perseverance complete its work so you will be complete. In other words, if you don't allow perseverance to complete its work, you will never be complete. If you don't allow perseverance to mature you, you will never be mature. You will not be mature and you will not be complete. You will be lacking something. Now here's what he's telling us. Jesus taught this as well. And the truth is, come on, let's just be honest. We know this. I mean, common sense kind of argues for this even though we don't like to face it. There's something about perseverance that makes us stronger. There's something about perseverance that makes us deeper. There's something about perseverance that makes our story more attractive. And this may be a new idea, especially if you grew up in church, but really the, the truth is spiritual, and this is throughout the scripture, spiritual maturity is always measured in terms of persevering faith, not perfect behavior. Now let me illustrate what I mean by that. Have you ever met a Christian that was so good. They were so good, they were sickening. It's like, really? You don't ever, I never, and I always, and I never, and I always, and I never, and I always, and you didn't want to take them out to lunch. You didn't want to be around them. You kind of looked at them like they were something in, a, in the zoo. Come here, I want to show you. Look at her. She never did anything wrong. Whoa, you know? It's like, you know, you, you appreciated the morality and the purity and the ethics. I mean, you did, you weren't critical, but it was like, and then you got to know them and you sort of scratched beneath the surface and you realized, well, no wonder you're so good. Life's been good to you. If life had been that good to me, I would be that good. If I'd grown up in a perfect family, I'd be perfect. You know, if I would, God gave me your looks and your background and perfect, perfect, perfect. I mean, you know, I'm not telling you to run out and do something bad, but I'm just saying, you know, you know we kind of look at you. I'm, you're not inspiring, you're intimidating. And then you meet a different kind of Christian. You meet a Christian that's a little rough around the edges. They don't use Sunday school language. They don't really have a Sunday school story. But their confidence in God is so stinking deep, it's attractive and that's intimidating too. And you hear their story and that you hear a story about them marching right down into the valley of the shadow of death and God made them camp there for a while. And then at some point in the future, after months or weeks or years, you know, God brought them out. And when they tell their story with their profanity and their non-Sunday school language, it's like you listen to the story and you think, oh my gosh, I'm just glad to know such faith exists. I'm glad to know you can face that kind of adversity and come out on the other end believing. And they say things like this, I would never want to go through that again, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it away for anything because of what I learned. And you are awed, not by their obedience. You are awed, not by their Bible knowledge. You are awed by the depth 
of their confidence in God. When you wonder to yourself, I'm not sure I would have trusted God throughout those circumstances. You know what they did? Do you know why that's so moving to us? They allowed perseverance to finish its work. You just met a mature believer. And yes, they're obedient. And yes, they've learned the scripture, but they've got real maturity. They are complete. In fact, the word actually means perfect. They've been perfected. They've not been perfected because they acted perfect. They've been perfected because in the valley of the shadow of death, they didn't hit the eject button. They said, God, I am going to trust you anyway. And what God does in the life of a man or a woman who stays there and allows perseverance to finish its work, it is inspiring. It removes all of our excuses. You find yourself thinking, you know what? I don't want to become like them the way they became like them, but I would like to be like them. And that's why James says, come on, come on. Let, this is the command, let endurance finish his work. Isn't that powerful? Now, this is the other cool thing about the Bible. That's why you should read the Bible. James is a realist. I mean, he knows we're thinking, ah, you know, I don't like this. Let's talk about prayer or something else, you know, change the subject. Now, I want to hear that God just blesses all the blessable people. And if I'm obedient, you know, it's a formula. And if you do these three things, God will do, I like that. And James is like, I don't know what God you're talking about, not our God. So, he, so James knows we have all these frustrations. So here's what he does next. He, he, the next thing he says is so practical. He says, now, and, and again, this next verse by itself is kind of a cool verse, but you can't read it by itself. It's connected to what we just read. He says this, if any of you, which is really gonna be all of us, if any of you, if any of you that's kind of marching down in the valley, if any of you who find yourself in an in the meantime moment or experience, if any of you are facing adversity, if any of you are facing a trial, if any of you are just surprised by bad news, if any of you lacks wisdom in the midst of that, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Now this is so in incredible to me. James says, look, I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be blindsided. I know what it's like to be doing everything right and then everything goes wrong. I get that. And when you find yourself in that in the meantime set of circumstances, ask God for wisdom. Literally, it's like God, you've, you've done this anyway. God, what's going on? Oh my gosh, God, what's going on? God, what's going on, what's going on? James says, pray this prayer. What the heck's going on? God, you know, show me what's going on. I need wisdom. I don't want to quit believing. I don't want to run away. I don't want to hit the eject button. I don't want to do something stupid. I don't want to compromise. I don't want to do the easy thing. I don't want to, you know, make my life more complicated. So God, I need wisdom. And wisdom within this context, wisdom is simply the ability, you know this, the ability to see current circumstances within a broader context. That's what wisdom is in general. Wisdom is the ability to see current circumstances that were so focused on my pain, my relationship. In fact, I didn't get into the school of my choice. Finances are upside down. My house won't sell. And I went ahead and bought another one. And my mama told me not to, but I did anyway. So whatever it is, we get very focused. We get very focused on current circumstances. Wisdom is the ability to see what we're frustrated about within the broader context. Now, every, every parent gets this, right? I mean, every, any, any, every parent gets this because your kids come running in, in middle school, especially high school, and their world, my world's falling apart. And you look at it and, you know, if you're a good parent, you act all concerned. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Then you walk out going, if only that was my problem. You know, if I wished I had a middle school problem, I would give anything for a middle school problem. And your middle school or their whole, you know, their whole world's this big. And, you, you know, you're 45, 47, 50 years old, and you're looking at their middle school problem within the context of a, an adult. And you're like, eh, you know, but, you know. And so, so James is saying, look, ask for wisdom. Say, God, I need a bigger context. I need a broader context. I'm not asking you to change it, but I don't want to run. So give me wisdom. And James says, God's not going to be upset about that request. In fact, God will answer that prayer for the person who is allowing endurance to finish its work.